Without interrupting my learned friend, I just want to. There's some part which is missing in our. I'll try to uh, upload it so I can share with you. Lot right. Right. Yes, Mr. Sarish. Yes. But I'm only to, uh, as, as my note said, I'm only uh, supplementing some of the submissions which have been made already. And I've just picked up the issues. One is about the construction of the uh, proviso to sub article 3 of 370. The attorney has addressed your law trip at length. Only a few points to add to what he has said. The width of power under Article 370, because that has been the subject matter of some discussion. The nature of the power exercised by President under various sub articles of Article 370. I don't think, I mean, there was a suggestion made that this might be executive in nature. The absence of a challenge on administrative law principle of abuse of power. It's necessary to get a few concepts in their right perspective. The exclusion of judicial review beyond the question of competence, questions that are in the that are political in nature. And the use of power under 356 to make changes that may be irreversible. And finally, the violation of basic structure. Very short submission in each of these headings. The first point relates to the construction of the proviso. Your Lordship have heard detailed submissions by the solicitor and by the attorney. And Malod, I just to want to put it in a, in a frame. So normally, these are the three aspects which one would look at the textual, the contextual, and the historical. We have Malod, uh, and the solicitor read it out to your uh, The author of the provision and the list of dates given by the solicitor sets out in detail, the confabulations, including differences of opinion on whether there should at all be a special treatment of Kashmir, then well, uh, Gopal Swami uh, Iyengar's draft, its brief discussion, and its adoption by the Constituent Assembly. And one thing was clear, this was an element mm -hmm. Accommodating certain compromises, political compromises within the constitutional framework. Your Lordship has read all of that. I'm not going to repeat reading any of that. But that has been sufficiently put across. And it now stands as it does. And its words have to be given their plain meaning. So, Marat, the first thing your Lordship would do in my respectful submission is the textual bit. Now, in the textual bit, what is of great significance in this point has been put. If the idea was that the President could act only to give effect to a recommendation of the Constituent Assembly, then that would have been made the precondition for exercise of power. Perhaps the article would have said, if a recommendation is received from the Constituent Assembly, then the President may. And your Lord, in fact, in the course of the hearing, my Lord, the Chief Justice gave the example of uh, certain other articles where it says, if a reference is made or if something is done, then. But that's not the frame in which this was drawn up. One of the articles, Malad, of that kind is 249. Okay, so very familiar with that. It starts by saying, if the Council of States has declared by resolution, then it shall be lawful to make laws. So that is a precondition for the exercise of power. But Mr. Salve, 
Yes. Does the proviso to Article 370 bracket 3 does not bring about the same result? Yes. By the use of the expression shall be necessary. Yes. So, my lord, shall be necessary here must then be subject to the principle that if there is a constituent assembly, then it's recommend. First of all, the word is recommendation, not concurrence. And secondly, that becomes necessary because you, can, if there is a constituent assembly, then you cannot act in vacuo. That was, in my respectful submission, the the textually, because my lord, we must first of all discern legislative intent out of language. And from the language, when the constitution knows or the, or the drafting of the constitution, the authors of the constitution knew that there were certain models in which it says, if something is done, then you may exercise a power. Is the president to act my Lord, only to give effect to the desire of the constituent assembly or is he to receive a recommendation from the constituent assembly? <coughs> and Obviously, the compromise was he must receive a recommendation from the Constituent Assembly, which obviously means if there is one, he must. Secondly, my lord, this very article, and we have all, all this is textual. This very article uses two separate expressions. B2 uses the word concurrence. I mean, that's a point which has been already made. And the proviso uses recommendation. Now, if Malad one had put concurrence here, the argument would still remain, but it would have been a much stronger place for the constituent assembly. So while Malad Distribution of the fields of legislation in subarticle B of uh, in clause B of subarticle one. Was put as concurrence of the government of the state. At the same time. Sub article 3 use the word recommendation. It's not an amendment, it's not this. So one must assume, and this was a article which had internal dissensions and differences, and it was very carefully crafted between the uh, within the uh, committee and within the assembly. There were differing points of view. So, Malad, we must give meaning to every every word of this article. So, the dif difference between concurrence and recommendation and its framing as a proviso. At two places, again, sub-article 2 says, if the concurrence. So, Malad, this is the very conscious departure from the concurrence, recommendation, consultation, recommendation, concurrence. One would perhaps say the difference is if you fail to consult, it is not fatal. If you fail to obtain a recommendation, if a recommendation is necessary, it is of more serious consequence. Would it be fatal? I don't know. Concurrence, obviously, because concurrence, then your power gets hedged in. And this is all textual. So, Mr. Sarvi, there is one countervailing consideration yes, which yes. we possibly may have to bear in mind. Yes. That where a change in the distribution of legislative power was envisaged, Yes. The provision spoke of concurrence. Yes. Except in the area which was covered by the instrument of accession. Yes. The exercise of the power under the proviso to clause 3 brings about a complete abrogation of status. Correct. Abrogation of 370. Yes. 
in which case all the limitations which are even introduced by the earlier provisions of clause of article 370 are are lifted yes including uh, the, the the concurrence on the distribution of legislative yes, power yes consultation yes now could it have been the intent that you require the concurrence for altering the distribution of legislative power or for altering any other provision of the constitution but for abrogating the article itself nothing more than a mere recommendation is required which Malad drops me i'm, I'm deeply obliged Malad, which brings me to the second the contextual power and the proviso is exercised yes then there is no limitation at all absolutely and that Malad brings me to be the contextual and in fact that was the direct intent and your lordship will see it from another point of view there's another point of view till the arrangement is in place unlike other states where the constitution sets out legislative powers in the seventh schedule in absolute terms and you need a very elaborate mechanism to tinker with those uh, seventh schedule it has to be 50 percent states voting etc your lordship knows the difference here there was a political agreement and the whole circumstances including as mr anger spells out the the the, the specter of uh, the united nations which today is of course irrelevant but at that time was very relevant the uh, problems in the state so there was a agreement which is embodied in b which has concurrence but if this led to a situation which ultimately prevented the purpose of 370 the purpose of 370 was not to create a permanent divide in the constitution and there are lots of material has been shown to you it was a phased integration I'm going to deal, Manat, Dr. Dhawan has raised a very interesting point of asymmetric federalism, whether that became part of the basic structure. I'm going to deal separately. But the historical material available to a court, and you know, we have, Manat, unlike certain other courts, we have always looked at historical material, especially for articles like this. There was a safety valve in sub Article 3. That if the political compromise in sub Article 1 fails to achieve the purpose, at any time it might become necessary to pull the plug. And sub Article 3 is that plug. Now, if one looks at it that way, the whole thing falls in place. We kept, the framers of the constitution kept with the president the power to do away with this special arrangement. Yes. And history will not bear testimony to the foresight and wisdom of those, Malad, despite the criticism at their time and the political debate, which has, which must in a democracy, you must always have the noise of a democracy, Mr. Bhutto used to say. The noise of the democracy is the most essential element of a democracy. So it's, this has been the subject of debate. But your Lordship has seen the entire history of how phase by phase this has been narrowed down. The divide has been narrowed. More and more subjects were added. More and more alignment was brought about. Because Malad, the historical perspective of 370 is very important. The troubled relations, while there's always was a hope that 
the relations with the neighboring country would be on good terms. The history of Kashmir did give rise to apprehensions. And your Lordship has seen all the material. So, border state with all its sensitivities is what compelled finally the Constituent Assembly to agree to the special arrangement. But with their wisdom, they said, while you phase it in, you have the power to pull the plug. And this is what I call the contextual interpretation. So the plain language, pure text, and the context. What is the context, uh, Mr. Salve? How is it distinct from yes. the historical background or the plain? Yeah, yeah, the historical the context is that this read by itself, forget the history, this read by itself shows that in sub-article 1, there is a divide in the legislative list base aligned to not the constitutional general seven schedule, but to an instrument of accession. Not broadly, the idea was aligned with the instrument of accession. That's how the powers will be shared. And a partial application of the Constitution of India, not in its entirety, but such other provisions. That's the D. That's the context. With a safety valve in three. And Malad. The history of this provision also tells us it may be difficult to find a logic in each of these because these were a political compromise. Why was the Constituent Assembly put there? That was a compromise. A lot of things are done to assuage ruffled feathers. There were two approaches. One was the jackboot saying, doesn't matter, things will settle down. Don't agree to anything special for Kashmir. The other was the other extreme saying, if the legitimacy of the accession is being questioned and there is a popular uprising, accommodate that. This was the compromise. So, one cannot search for too much logic. This was the compromise form. And we must therefore, Malad, the safest thing for a court, in my very respectful submission, as a matter of constitutional interpretation of such provisions, and such provisions are essentially political, and I don't mean pol political in its pejorative sense, I mean it political as the, in its constitutional sense. The court has always said you must give it the widest possible meaning. In fact, Malad, I'll give your lordship that passage, Justice Pandian, I think Justice Panyan, in his majority opinion, where he upheld the ab abolition of the privy purse, where the lordships upheld the abolition of the privy purse, he says that our constitution was meant to be flexible in these areas. I'll give your lordship the exact passage. The fact that the ground realities would change in Jammu and Kashmir and 370 would accommodate 
was one of first recognized by your lordship in the Makbul Damnu case, which has been cited. The, the challenge brought where Mr. Garg argued that without the uh, Sadr Riyasat, you could not have the uh, preventive detention law. And your lordship said state means state as, as exists from time to time. That is not already there. I'll give your lordship the uh, passage 72 1 Supreme Court cases 536. You have given us para 28. It's there, Malad. It's volume 1 uh, CLC and PDF. Para 28 there. Para 28. So, this was already one example of how this evolved. And that, my lord, back scene with the principle of construction. Your lord, the attorney just cited um, the uh, presidential reference case, which says, well, if there is a requirement, then the, if, if, if there is a constituent assembly, you must get the recommendation. But if there is no constituent assembly, are you denuded of the power? And the presidential reference, my lord, the attorney just gave your lot tips a moment ago. The judgment based on a passage on impossibility. And your lordship cited with approval craze on legislation, the sixth edition in the presidential reference. The attorney just gave it, Malad. Yes. I have, Malad, for your lordship's assistance, given the ninth edition of craze. I believe it's attached to uh, my submissions. There's some slight interesting change in the text. I believe it is at PDF page 37. Uh, this, this is Salve, which is your compilation of it. Well, it's, it's, I believe it has been given along with my note. This is along with the note itself? Yes. This is not the, from the ninth edition of Craze. It's called Disregarding the Impossible. Para 8.2.9. It is appended to the note. Uh, what page did you say, Mr. Zari? Page 37 PDF. Yes. Disregarding the impossible. Yes. Yes. There's a slight difference in text from what your lordships approved. And in fact, it's, it's even more uh, instructive. It says, one of the ancient maxims of common law is lex, is, uh, lex non cogi ad impossibilia. As Broom's legal maxim puts it, the maxim, or as it is expressed, impotentia excusat legion, must be understood in the qualified sense that impotentia excuses, where there is a necessary or invincible disability to perform the mandatory part of law of forbear. It is akin to the maxim of the Roman law, nemo tenetor ad impossibilia, which derived from common sense and natural equity has been adopted and applied by the law of England under various and dissimilar circumstances. The result of the application of the maxim which remains potent is that the draftsman need not expressly excuse that compliance which is obviously impossible. So, for example, if requiring a particular communication to take the prescribed form, the draftsman need not generally state that the requirement can be lawfully ignored where no form has been prescribed for that purpose. There may be occasions, however, where the sense of the legislation makes it arguable that the primary provisions are not to operate at all until certain mechanisms have been put to place by subordinate legislation. If the draftman thinks it is necessary to avoid a suggestion of that kind, he will generally qualify a reference to the prescription by if any of that kind. So, Malad, the principle is very interesting. In fact, we have used it in a different branch, Malan. In service law, for example, we've used it all the time. 
It says your promotion will be as per rules. Now, if no rules are framed, doesn't mean you won't get a promotion. Can you follow whatever is the general principle? But if there are rules, they must be strictly followed. Oh, my Lord, this was the argument um, in, in this court, of course. I, I went through the judgment. It, it didn't get to that point of deciding it. Uh, the old Malad section 80J rule 19 1J and and the argument was for example if it says deduction of capital employed if there are rules you follow them if there are no rules doesn't mean the exemption fails but there are other provisions which says you will get such other deductions as rules may provide and that you can't operate unless there are rules so we have had one of these two formats and that is why we come back to why did the framers of the constitution not say that if the president receives a recommendation from the constituent assembly, then he may. And instead say the president may abrogate this article, provided if he gets a recommendation from the constituent assembly. Which if there is one, you must get the recommendation, otherwise. Not. Now, Marat, this was also made. Just one minute. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Sarve, I think perhaps uh, we'll just wait for a second, Mr. Yes, Mr. Sarve. Uh, Mr. Sarve, voice is perhaps for a moment he was. Uh... No, I'm not. Yes, Mr. Sarve. Yes. Can your Lordship hear me, Mr. Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Finally, Mr. Look at one important nuance of this article. Yes. In 
सब क्लॉज डी ऑफ क्लॉज बी सच ऑफ दी अदर प्रोविजन ऑफ दिस कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन शल अप्लाई इन रिलेशन टू दैट स्टेट सब्जेक्ट टू सच एक्सेप्शन एंड so power to the president to apply or disapply provisions of the constitution or apply them with modifications and this does not require unlike b 1 that is the spread in the list the concurrence is not called for uh, let's look at it now mr sardi let's see that again i don't yes uh, if your lordship sees mm. 372 1b 1 is the spread my lord of the list small sub clause is 1 and 2 is the corresponding to the ioa yes that requires consultation that requires concurrence that is that comes in through the first proviso see proviso no such order requires, which relates to requires a uh, concurrence yes yeah, b1 requires con, uh, concurrence a uh, consultation no, consultation correct my lord and no such order which relates to matter other than those referred shall be in the concurrence of that so this was built in this dichotomy was built in there itself not two things my lord your lordship will note applying or disapplying provisions of the constitution no mr sahu i could not get this argument yeah, yes i may i just restate the point now clause d relates to not 370 but other provisions of the constitution absolutely and they can be applied disapplied or with such modifications as the president considers appropriate and that is with the concurrence of that government yes correct my lord and sub article 2 says is the concurrence referred to in paragraph 2 of b of clause 1 such other matters or in the second proviso that is malad would be d be given before the constituent assembly for framing of the constitution it will be placed before the assembly for such decision as it may take there on so this was meant to operate much beyond the constituent assembly also because that concurrence would continue for all forever there would always be a state government but a state government what that state government is another matter there would there would always be a state government but disapplying 370 was carved out and put in 3 now that can't be a provision limited in time to the existence of the constituent assembly and that is what explains perhaps why the recommendation rather than concurrence this is sorry your voice was cracking just a little bit you know when you are making this the last part of your argument yes. maybe uh, I'll, i'll repeat it but Yeah, this applying three seventy itself comes under sub article three, right? And that is why perhaps the framers of the constitution scaled it down to recommendation instead of concurrence, and that to put it in a proviso that when there is a constituent assembly during the life of the constituent assembly. if you decide to modify 370 or disapply 370 because the whole purpose of the constituent assembly was to work 
to try and find this area of accommodating both. That's so, if China, I, Mr. Salve, we got your point. Yeah, that that's all. The, this is a proviso. Yes. To, it uses the word recommendation and it doesn't yes. say if there is a recommendation. We got that yes. point. We got that line of argument. I was just closing it by saying. You are making just a little while ago. Yes. Was that you, you, you began by saying that B1. Yes. Requires consultation. Matters in the list other than those covered by the IOA requires concurrence. That is B2. Then we went to D. Yes. D says subject to such exceptions and modifications as the president may order by order specify. Yes. There also there is a bifurcation. Yes. Those matters which refer to the instrument of accession require consultation. Other matters other than those governed by the instrument of accession require concurrence. Correct. Now, the point which I was making, ah, perhaps that, that, that got lost. We wanted you to just uh, come back yes. again. Yes. So, again, Malad, why this subtlety of instrument of accession being consultation and other than instrument of accession <clears throat> being concurrence, the significance should not be missed. Where it comes to instruments of accession, and terms of accession, the last word is with the union. No, where do you say that? How do you say that? Because, Malad, instrument of accession requires consultation, not concurrence. The first proviso. Subjects are so important. Consequence. Why this dichotomy in the first and second proviso, Marat? Your Lordship would have to reflect over. And that also, Marat, feeds into my point, therefore, that where it comes to disapplying the 370 completely, because the whole idea of 370 was accommodating. the political compromise in the accession. You know, Mr. Salve. Yes. Clause B of 370, 371B. Yes. Does not relate to the power to make adaptations, modifications or exceptions at all. Yes. What 371B says is, that of all the items in the three lists, the president, the power to the power of parliament to make laws would be limited by specific matters. Yes. So you take the matters in the list as they are, and then you define what would be the domain of parliament to make the law. There is no power to make exceptions or modifications in clause B at all. No. Not at all. Bifurcate. You correctly said that there was a bifurcation. Matters which are referable to the instrument of accession are those on which you only require consultation because yes. these matters clearly specified in the IOA: defence, foreign affairs, communication. Therefore, when when Parliament specified the matters on which it would make laws, if those matters were referred to in the IOA. Only consultation of the state government was required. Yes. Because they were specified in black and white in the IOA. Correct. But matters which were not specified in the IOA but are governed by the three lists, concurrence is required. And Malod. Now, when it comes to when it comes sorry, to yes. D, D is not just specification of matters. D is making exceptions or modifications. That's right. There again they had a dichotomy. You can make ex exceptions or modifications, but if it relates to matters in the IOA, consultation. Only consultation. So you are really yes. right that in so far as D is concerned, in regard to matters which are specified in the IOA, only consultation is required. 
And, and my Lord, one cannot miss the significance, what I wanted to add, of the overlay of the principle of international law, which is engrafted in 363. That these are matters primarily for the sovereign. Instruments of accession and their interpretation has always been a matter for the sovereign. And here the accession being complete, irrevocable and irreversible. That is clear. One and three, Article one and three. Where it touched the instrument of accession, the president had the last word. And that philosophy is reflected in sub-article. That if you want to completely disapply this political arrangement, if there is a constituent assembly, consult them, otherwise you can do it. And there also recommendation. In other words, Mr. Sarve, what you're trying to drive at is that clause three of article 370 yes. is absolutely on the same uh, is, is on the same philosophy or, or is the same, same platform yes. as clause B1. And the first proviso to D. You are trying to equate the power and the, the substantive part of clause 3. The underpinning is the same, Malad. The, power the underpinning the, is the same. The first proviso to D and B1. Yes. And because the underpinning is, this is where we accommodated, or this is where the powers that be when framing the constitution accommodated, the political compromise in Kashmir. And unsurprisingly, Unsurprisingly, they reserved the power in the president instead of driving one to, to Article 368. They reserved the power in the president to disapply this entire. It's a very unusual provision, Malad. There is no other equivalent. <laughs> the executive the president is executive government. Where the executive government can disapply. A provision of the constitution. The only internal problem with that argument, Mr. Sarve, we'll, we'll reflect on yes. it, uh, doing the research in the yes. next hour. Yes. That where the power to do something lesser in terms of constitutional impact is hedged in with restrictions, namely the power to make exceptions and modifications, can we subsume that the power to have something greater, which has yes. greater constitutional impact, namely the abrogation itself? will be bereft of all limitations. Malad, to which my respectful response is, there is a compromise. I keep in my control, because the, the accession is complete. Let, let, let's, so what are the understanding? It's a part of India. One and three apply. It's an Indian state. But I have a political compromise in which sub-article one has how it will operate. That's the compromise. But sub-article 3 is to put the compromise to an end. And I reserve that power. Mr. Sarve, we are almost at the anvil of lunch. Just yes. one, uh, maybe one of the juniors can do it here in the court as well. Yes. Found which were those matters governed by B1 and which were the govern matters governed by B2. B1 basically covered the three subjects. Yes. Now, which were the matters in the IOA to which the first proviso to D applies. We'll better try and respond to that at 2 p.m. Uh, so we'll, I, I, I see that. I see that. That will give us some insight on what was the intent. Yes, of yes, yes. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm deeply obliged. We'll do that. So many articles that deal with defense, which are covered by the instrument of accession. Yes. That list is given. I had in my list of dates, Lotsis would recall the uh, sub article A1 says that the president would demarcate which entries fall within those three areas. So there was a specific order passed, possibly the first order. 48 or 54. Yes, Blood, which uh, 50, Blood, uh, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 
telecommunication, postal so communication, I... etc., etc. So three entry. So which were the other articles? No, we'll, we'll uh, respond to that in two no, minutes. Because D, the first proviso to D, D for Delhi, deals with other articles, not the specification of matters in the list. D1, D, sorry, not D1. The pro first proviso to clause D deals with other matters which are governed by the instrument of accession, where again consultation only is required. We are just sort of understanding Mr. Sarvey's. Communication is also in the list. That is also not other articles. No, no, I don't think Mr. Sibal has understood. Malod, I, I followed your Lordship's question. I'll here. respond to it too. That may have some bearing, Mr. Sarvey. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Our argument on clause 3. That's why. Yes, Malod. Yes, yes, I'll do it at 2. I'll do it at 2. Very interesting point. We'll also leave it here. Yes. yes. Right, the list is also there. Which one is also? Your lordships have it? Yes. Just one second. Yes. My lord, Mr. Surakant has it. Yes, it's easy. If your lordship sees, it's very interesting. Page one. Oh, sorry, page one. Clause one is the accession. Yes. He says, I hereby declare I accede to the dominion with the intent of the Governor General of India. So, 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 by virtue of this, my instrument of accession, but subject to the terms and for the purpose of dominion, exercise such function that may be vested. By them in the Government of India Act as in the Dominion of India on the 15th day of August. I hereby assume the obligation of ensuring that due effect is given to the provisions, etc. Now look at three, ma'am. I accept the matter specified in the schedule as the matters with respect to which the Dominion legislature may make this, may make law for this state. So this is B1. Yes. This corresponds to clause B1. Yes, ma'am. And this was in a schedule, which I'll show your lordships in a moment. I shall, I hereby declare that I accede to the dominion of India on the assurance that if an agreement is made between the governor general and the ruler of the state, whereby any functions in relation to the administration of this state, of any law of the dominion legislature, shall be exercised by the ruler of the state then such agreement shall be construed and have effect accordingly. Now, my Lord, comes the most important thing. In sub, uh, 6 says, nothing in the instrument will impart dominion to make any law authorizing compulsory acquisition. Now, this is interesting. This is a carve out from the legislative list principle. But I hereby undertake that should the dominion apply, etc. Now, my Lord, seven is important. Nothing in the instrument shall be deemed to commit in any way to the acceptance of any future constitution or fetter my discretion. And nothing in the instrument affects the continuance of my sovereignty and over the state, save as provided under the instrument. Now, this was the instrument of accession, but the constitution, finally, my Lord, if the Lordship now matches this with 370, and, and I'm sorry, Malad, for completeness, the schedule your Lordship will find in volume 4, page So basically, defense, external affairs, and communications. Correct. Now, my lord, what happened? But what the spread in 370 corresponds to is very important. 
370 starts by saying the Part B provision will not apply. 238 was not. Then it says the power of parliament to make law shall be limited to those matters in the union and the concurrent list which in the consultation with the government of the state are declared by the president to correspond to matters specified in the instrument of accession. So this was on the issue of the legislative list and that schedule. Matching them with our seven schedule and the president would decide how the seven schedule is to be divided. And here it's only consultation consistent with the philosophy that accession and instruments of accession these are what are in international law called political documents not not political in the political sense political I, think the, uh, I think mr sarve it's very clear now if the president wanted to make any exceptions or modifications yes in respect of defense communication or external affairs then only consultation, only consultation was required. Correct. Now, my lord, of the first proviso to clause D. Correct. Now, my lord, applying other provisions of the constitution, and my lord, I don't have to uh, give your lordships a catalog of which are the other provisions. I mean, there are so many important provisions of the constitution. They would be phased in and applied under D. Right. And for that, they uh, said concurrence. They would, require, they would require concurrence. They would require they, concurrence. They referred to either defense, uh, correct, correct. Or the well, defense the legislative or lists. affairs or communications. Broadly, let us say the legislative lists are put to one side because that is really power to make laws. Yes. But for the institutions, the, your lordship's jurisdiction under 32, for example. The constitution also, yes. Your lordship's jurisdiction under 32. Should it extend or should it not extend to Jammu and Kashmir? These are, and what about public service commission? What about election commission? So on and so forth. So not all those were provisions to be applied if necessary with adaptation. Now not what is important, and I come back therefore to my point. This, how does this align with a complete accession? Subarticle, article three is the answer. That this is an arrangement for the phased introduction of the constitution, keeping or reserving unto the president the power to disapply this article. Now, obviously, for that, there cannot be con con uh, concurrence. So it makes sense. Recommendation if there is a constituent assembly, otherwise the action of the president. This was the arrangement, this was the compromise. And Marat, this compromise was not just with the state of Jammu and Kashmir, the solicitor has placed before your lordships. The sharp differences of view, even in the Congress Working Committee, they rejected this plan. First time when uh, Sri Gopal Angar presented it. Sardar Patel's letter is cited in the solicitor's list of uh, dates. He said, sorry, I don't accept this. So there were, this was a very con a matter with more than one point of view and com competing points of view. So this was the compromise formula, which is incorporated here in the constitution. This was the workable arrangement. This is all right. Ultimately, we will decide and we will keep to ourselves the power to disapply this article. But if this works, phase by phase, introduction of the constitution, why not? And it did work to a large extent. So why not that principle, which was, which my lord, the chief justice was pleased to put to me, about lesser power and larger power, would it not require greater safeguard? That, that would not occur. That's what I call the contextual argument. I am not finished with this, and I have uh, eye on the clock. <laughs> if yes, there's anything sir. more, I can assist your lordship on this point. Otherwise, let me move to my next. Point. You can move. I think we can move to your next point, Mr. Sarvi. Yes. Yes. 
Second point is, Manod, uh, there have been some arguments about even if 370 applies, because no radical change. And Delhi laws were cited. Now, Manod, from cleaning up, because some principles need, need to be clearly stated. The Birla cotton mills in read Delhi laws, the power to extend laws. You cannot make a radical change. Well, that can have no application here. That principle can have no application here. Because the Lordship has seen those cases. The your lordships read down the power to extend and apply laws under Article 14. The argument was excessive delegation. You have conferred upon the executive the power to change a law made by parliament and its application. And that is why your lordship said we read it down. That the philosophy, the basic policy of the law cannot be changed, radical changes cannot be made. Malad 370 is a part of the constitution itself. There is no question of excessive delegation. This is a power conferred on the president. And that is why Malad Lakhanpal rejects this approach. But I was giving your lordships an answer on first principles. Yes. The power Malad, under 370 is plenary in nature. And this is a power conferred by the constitution. A plenary power is not subject to the principle of, or is not amenable to a challenge of excessive delegation because the constitution has made this delegation. Where parliament makes a law which is subject to article 13, or where the state legislature makes a law which is subject to article 13, then an article 14 challenge can be brought saying this is excessive delegation. And all the Delhi laws, in re Delhi laws downwards cases, all dealt with excessive delegation in statutory provisions on the anvil of Article 14. It is completely irrelevant to 370. Your Lordship has already said this in Puranmal, but I wanted to just put it on first principles. Yes. The second Malad point is that the power exercise is legislative in character. I don't think I need to belabor that point very hard. Applying provisions and disapplying provisions, modifying provisions of a law is legislative in character. I don't think I need to cite authority for that matter. To suggest that this is an executive power is like saying ordinance making is executive power. And it is done by orders, Malad. I'll just give you a lot of citation. The Meghalaya case, which schedule five, for example, of the constitution. 1972, one Supreme Court case is 148, just for reference. Where your lordships have said that because there also the president can by order say this and by order say that. You're not saying this. Yeah. 
So this is now what, what follows from a plenary power and a power which is legislative in character. It has a direct bearing on the next issue of the extent of judicial review of the exercise of that power. Because that more logically takes me to my next point that the Ajit Mills principle, as Justice Krishna has explained in Ajit Mills, In the context of a law made by parliament, if you say this is abuse of power or cultural legislation, it's an argument of competence, not of motive. That is not the Ajit Mills principle. Your lordship knows when the first law was made, saying uh, if you've collected illegal sales, sales tax, which is not chargeable, if you've collected, you pay. The argument was this, this is colorable legislation because you're taking away. And this is Krishna's answer, Manad. I'll just give the page and para numbers. 77 4 SCC, page 98. Manad, this is attached to my notes. Please. Manad, this is attached to my notes starting from page 6. Uh, page 4, sorry. And the relevant paras. But Mr. Sarve, even if it is a legislative power, Yes. As you say it is, and probably it is, it's amenable to judicial review on the ground of Article 14. A legislative power cannot be challenged on the ground of malafides. So you cannot exactly. say that Parliament did something because of a malafied intent, because you don't attribute malafides to a collective body of individuals. That's the reason for That's it. That's correct. Malat. More than that. Nagaraj, when they re reduce the age of retirement, uh, our court said you can't challenge uh, the reduction in the age of retirement on the ground that parliament was acting malafide because it's a collective Correct. body. Malafide that is, is something which you attribute to an individual. More, more than that, my lord, your lordships have always said, where it comes to colorable device, supplementary, and all these, as it is, my lord, explained in this judgment, Actually, they started. It is really a competence argument. Colorable, colorable exercise of power in Tulok, our court said. It really means that though competence. you are purporting to exercise power under one entry, you have yes. actually transgressed into another entry. So it's That's, really a question of absence of power, legislative. It's a competence power. argument. It's a competence argument. Yes. Unla it's not the Wednesbury unreasonableness. But equally, Article 14 would be attractive. Well, 14 be, the test of Article 14. Well, 14 can have no application to an Article 370 sub Article 3 situation. Of course, legislative power you can, if you make a rule which is plainly discriminatory, you can strike it down and violate it. Because the, uh, uh, if, if Article 13 applies, if Article 13 applies, the whole panoply of uh, fundamental rights applies. But therefore, assuming that this is a legislative power, it is not immune to challenge on the ground of violation of fundamental rights. Correct. Fundamental rights, whether a 370 sub Article 3 disapplying Article 370 is at all amenable to fundamental rights? Question mark. I tell you, I address your lordship for a, for a minute on that. Because this is a relationship between the union and a unit of that union. We are now units part of that union. They may be parts of that relationship which create rights in favor of individual citizens. But right? if, if it affects an individual... The article part of that, the provision of the... on, on, on the right of residence. An individual, for instance, can say that I and people belong to my class as the exclusive right of residence in this state, by bringing in others, you are affecting my right under Article 14. Whether there is substance or not is a different thing altogether. But it's amenable to that challenge. You can't say that the challenge is immune. Well, Lord, I, I, I would respectfully submit, applying or disapplying the constitutional provision would not give an individual citizen a right. Because I'll tell you, Lordship, this takes us back to the basic principle of 
this is adjusting the accession. Now, Lord, in international law, for example, a, a, a citizen can never assert that I had certain rights under an earlier legal regime. And now there is an accession, those rights should be continued. Your Lordships have rejected that, consistent following the principle of international law. You have only such rights as are available to you within the territory. Now, in that, if there is a discrimination, you can challenge. Today, my Lord, how which constitutional regime will apply in Jammu and Kashmir is more in, in one sense almost a constituent power. So, my Lord, Article 14 challenge on the ground that I was a citizen, I was living in Kashmir, nobody else was allowed to enter here. Now you've taken away my rights. That argument will not be open. That's quite apart from, of course, the submission of the solicitor that by the abrogation, you expanded the panoply of rights which are individual, uh, which an individual in Jammu and Kashmir has. You have no, not I'm not taking that. an extreme case. Can an individual come and say, I had a right to live here, splendid isolation? You've taken away that right, and now all Indians have the rights, which I earlier had as a special right. Your contention is that the residents' right to live in Jammu and Kashmir is not taken away. Nothing. Their rights are expanded by applying the whole of the Indian constitution. Nobody has a vested right in a state of governance in that sense. And Sabat and Manat 370 is a part of the constitution where the president has a power to disapply the constitution. If he disapplies the constitution, how can a citizen complain? A resident of that state. As much as a resident, of outside Kashmir could not say, why am I made subject to parliamentary legislation when this subject in the state of Jammu and Kashmir is not. And in fact, Malad, we used to always, used to always, uh, I remember the late Altaf Ahmad, used to always have a little, little joke. He says, you people have lost the right to property. We haven't. 19 Maref continued, the equivalent continued under the Jammu and Kashmir constitution. We got rid of property rights. Now, could an Indian complain, could a person outside Kashmir, a fellow Indian say that my fellow Indian there in Jammu and Kashmir has a right to property. If you take his property, you have to pay him full compensation. But if I am outside Jammu and Kashmir, take my property and you can show me the, a blank piece of paper and there's nothing I can do. D70 now leads to the abrogation of 191F in Jammu and Kashmir. It does. But which is not a part of the basic structure. 191F has been, has been held. Not it it is not system. as much today if you are creating a larger equality. The solicitor has developed this point. You've created a larger equality. Where is the question of violating 14? And individuals, Malad, that principle must be extended. Your lordships have dealt with this problem. Where the argument was, there were uh, prior leases. Your Lordship said, sorry, post-accession, you have what the law gives you. You have nothing else. Now, if post-accession... Yeah, actually, we need not really explore this line yeah, exactly. much for the reason that this might have impacts on other parts of the Constitution. And that's why I'm not... I was... The constitution which creates rights in favor of specific groups. Yeah, Manu, that is why I limited whether myself. Whether they are based on religion, whether they are based know, on caste, on marginalization. So to say that by obliterating that right, the you are not affected by a larger equality. Manu, 370 operates. If we accept it in that broad sense. No, no, Manu, three, that, that is why I am saying 370. Because I don't know what the ramifications No, no, Manu, 370 operates in a very narrow area. Very narrow area. It operates in the context of the compromise formula put in place for Jammu and Kashmir at the time of accession 
and at the time of its integration into India, etc., etc., and this power was kept to disapply this one provision, this special arrangement. Now, Lord, there is no equivalent in the constitution. So we need to go, Malad, uh, uh, the Chief Justice is saying, that the danger in getting into constitutional propositions in one context and making broader observations, Malad, we don't know what you are trampling underfoot for the future. My limited submission was the principle of limiting delegation by statute, which comes from Article 14, can't apply. This radical change is reading down of the power to extend laws. That point you've made, Mr. Sarvey. Yeah, that that's the only point which I was making. That was, yes, the second that point, point I was making was... Restricted to that level, there is no difficulty. That's, no, that's all. Difficulty. And the second point which I was making was, Bharat, that here abuse of power is really a power of competence. And nobody has challenged the... So we the clause 3 of Article 7, 370. That is which, which Malad, in fact, brings me part of the original constitution. In fact, Malad, which brings me to my next point. And I'm going quickly now because your Lordship has seen the point. That this repeated reference to basic structure, Malad, quite frankly, even in some of your Lordship's judgments, I find a little surprising. Basic structure was not a principle as an independent standalone constitutional right. Basic structure is the limitation inherent in 368. And constitutional amendments are tested with reference to the basic structure of doctrine. Well, there are some judgments which do say this this law not only violates 14 but violates the basic structure. Well, laws, strictly speaking, laws if you know, it's laws a, don't a, violate the basic structure. Laws can't violate basic structure. Laws violate part three or don't violate part three. You know, in two judgments, though, we have said that a particular law, we have said a particular law protects the basic structure. Why? But laws are aligned with the basic structure. Places of Worship Act in Ayodhya, we say that is in pursuance of the... Correct. But not laws... The second, the second we said that the amendment to... The introduction of the amendment for Delhi in yes. 239AA was in furtherance of the basic structure, which is... But not furtherance of basic structure... So we, there's, has, there's a little bit of... Uh, no, but, but, but let us... Let, us let me but not try and... In my very humble submission... Give a, when a law is made to protect civil liberties, 21 is a part of basic structure. A law made to protect civil liberties is a law aligned with Article 21 and therefore aligned with the basic structure. Now, one may in a flourish of language say it is to further. Today, if there are checks and safeguards built into arrest, checks and safeguards built into criminal trials, etc., etc., you may say this is to protect the basic structure because the basic structure is the trilogy of rights. Now, Malad, that is that is not to say that the law was tested on basic structure. That distinction you have made, yes, of yes. course, because as a doctrine, it was evolved to test the validity right. of the constitutional the, amendment. The problem is, Malad, one thing is to say something is aligned or not aligned with the basic structure. But to say that if exercise of power under 370 can be tested on the basic structure doctrine, I submit is a misconception. 370 itself is a part of the of the original prestige constitution. And that confers the power to disapply the constitution, the, the arrangement. If I am right on competence, Anything else, Mr. Sarvey, now? Similar, that is the basic structure point. Yes. And <clears throat> the point which we have therefore already made, 
and I close with that submission. How would your lordship interpret this? The nature of the provision is such, if it confers plenary powers, not in the field of civil rights, not in the field protected by part three, but in the area of governance and in the area of constitutional adjustments, your lordship will give it the widest possible. Because the idea is never to hedge in future generations by reading the constitution narrowly. That is a well-settled principle. Last point which I have to make, my lord, is if we are wrong on this, the 356 test. Can a change of permanence be made when a 356 regime is in place? It has two answers. I'll just take two minutes on this. This is no longer res integra. Your lordships have right from uh, Rajasthan and Union of India, Bomai, chiseled this law and said, up to the stage where parliament approves, don't do anything which is irreversible. Thereafter, you may. Because everything in one sense is irreversible. Man. What parliament does is also irreversible. Parliament passes the budget for the states. It takes over the coffers of the state. What money is spent is irreversible. The money is gone. But that's the way it is. The president may have a lot dismiss people, appoint people, create institutions, remove institutions. The governor may do, the president may do under 356. Those are for those people irreversible actions. That is why. That is why your Lordship has said 356 is draconian and should be very sparingly used. If the unfortunate circumstances if the unfortunate circumstances require that for a defined period of time the system of governance is changed under 356. If those unfortunate circumstances exist and a very narrow area of judicial review is permissible, it doesn't arise because there is no challenge before your lordship, a, a, a bald prayer without the necessary averments of the challenge, then my lord, one has to accept the consequences of 356. But that's in the alternative. If I am right on my construction, my lord, the proviso, quite frankly, minus the constituent assembly, it fell away. So you just added the state as legislature and then you acted for the state legislature. Nothing uh, lord, dramatic really happened. If one ignores that also, if we are right on the proviso, then none of those questions arise. That, my lord, is the submission. Unless there's something else I could assist your lordship. Thank you, Mr. Sarve. That, that would be all. Thank you, Mr. Sarve.